Hey, what's going on? Guy Haberman here, podcast from Las Vegas. That's right, I'm in Vegas. Previously unannounced uh, and unreported trip to Vegas, but the flight was so cheap, the hotel was so cheap, and um, I decided to just come and uh, see what happened. So I arrived on Tuesday morning. If you're watching this on YouTube, great. Like the video. Got a few things I want to hit in this video. If you're listening to the podcast, fantastic. Love it. Thank you. Glad you're here. Share it with friends, and um, you know we'll see. we got more stuff coming up this week. But uh, landed this morning, Southwest, touchdown, took, uh, took a quick little Uber, easy, to the hotel, dropped off the bag, walked by the Raider Image store, and... Um, and uh, went over to the uh, media center, which is in Mandalay Bay. That's where all the the radio row um, and a lot of the uh, some of the fan experience stuff is. I guess um, had some press conferences. They had they did some of that stuff today. But hopped on a shuttle, went to the uh, Hilton Lake Las Vegas, which is a I've been out there one time. Can't lie, it's a weird weird little vibe, weird place. Anyway, that's like twenty five minutes out. That's where the Niners are staying. Uh, it was a zoo. I mean, it was packed. They have like 10 players out there. Each get their own little podium. And that's it. I think tomorrow they're going to have the whole team out there and they're going to have tables and stuff. I have been pretty struck by, and I know, you know, we talked about it last week when the line came out. We talked about it before the NFC and AFC championship games. What would the lines be? Uh, surprised that the Niners are a two point favorite. That hasn't changed. What, what has surprised me is how everybody the Niners are the underdog <laughs> they're the favorite but the way everybody's talking about them is like they don't deserve to be the favorite and that they should be the underdog and um a lot of people are picking against them I was just looking 70 percent of the bets and 70 percent of the money uh is on the Kansas City Chiefs understandable I mean you get the Chiefs I think you get them like plus you might be able to get a plus two and a half definitely plus two the sharp money the betting trend says is on the 49ers. But uh, what I'm reacting to is not the line, just talking to people and listening to people talk. Everybody thinks the Chiefs should be favored. Everybody. Uh, because their defense, a lot of it goes to Mahomes. A lot of it is about how the Niners have looked the last two weeks. I heard Ross Tucker say today that uh, he thinks if these two teams played 10 times, and I'm like, all right. As he said it, I in my head I said, okay, I think he's going to say six. I think he's going to say the Chiefs would win six times. But he didn't. He said the Chiefs would win seven times. And the sense I get from talking to people is that that's what most people think. Like, I think the right answer to say is six times. I think if you've got Patrick Mahomes, you, you get the little over 50% bump. To me, it's a big jump from six to seven. Doesn't sound like a lot, but think of it from a percentage standpoint, like 70% free throw shooter, 60% free throw shooter, 70% passer, 60% passer. That's a massive difference. And so uh, I'm a little surprised that if you told me everyone was saying six out of ten times the Chiefs would win, I'd go, okay. I think you could lean like five and a half out of ten. If you think about what this team looked like over the course of the regular season and what the 49ers looked like over the course of the regular season, I think it's pretty clear the version of the Chiefs that played the regular season is gone. This version, the the flip-the-switch version, they're here. Now, Joe Thune's out at guard. They're a little banged up, a menahu, but they got Patrick Mahomes. And if you got Patrick Mahomes, you get the 60 40 split. You just do. I mean, we're talking about an all time great. And the Niners don't have an advantage at quarterback, right? At, at coach. Um, maybe it's even. Okay. Maybe in the grand scheme, in the long run, Andy's had the better career, no question to this point. Maybe when it's all said and done, Kyle and Andy will be viewed as equals. I think if we just think about like coach versus coach, I do view them as equals. Obviously, Andy's resume is far superior. But, you know, I think both of these teams had the advantage in offensive uh, coach-quarterback combo in the – well, in, in every game they've played. The Chiefs had the advantage against Miami. They had it against Buffalo, definitely when it came to the coordinator. And then they had it coordinator and coach when it came to Baltimore. The Niners had the advantage. Uh, I, yeah, I would say coordinator – and quarterback advantage against Green Bay. Maybe LaFleur will prove to be an equal to Kyle, but Niners' slight advantage there. And then Niners' advantage, I think I've said, and I said this going into the game, I think Brock's the better quarterback uh, than Jared Goff. At minimum, I don't. I think at minimum you'd have to say they're equals. I, I know I talked to a former quarterback today who said he thinks Goff's better. This was before the game. But like John and I talked about the other day, 
you know, the athleticism that Brock has not only is a separating factor with golf, but we actually saw it be a separating factor in the game. And, um, you know, you take Kyle over Ben Johnson at this point. So without question. Um, now, for both those teams, that advantage is gone. So now you got to go to the defensive side. And that's where I think people are, are betting on the Chiefs. But I, you know, I, like I said, I think the Kansas City regular season version is gone. I think the, the regular season version of the Niners can reappear. Um, now, that's, that's a lot about defense. It's also a lot about starting fast on offense. There's no reason why they should not be able to start fast on offense. I know Kansas City's got a very good defense. They want to, they're going to blitz, blitz Brock because they really believe in their secondary. Fine. I, I think Brock Purdy would welcome that. I think the Niners would welcome that. So, um, to me, 7 out of 10, it's just – that's too much. Six out of ten, fine. You want to go six and a half out of ten, sixty-five percent of the time, okay. Five and a half out of ten, that, that's the sweet spot. But seven out of ten is too much. And I'm just telling you, I, I I don't know. You know, you guys can tell me where you're at. People that you talk to, if you're spending a bunch of time around Niner fans, then maybe you're getting a different vibe. Uh, but the media, the media, not only does the media think the Chiefs are going to win, the vast majority of these people. Uh, the public thinks that because they're betting them. And um, I think they think, the vibe I get is they think that the Niners are going to get handled, which I do not think that. I have I said a few weeks ago I think the Niners are winning this game, and Mahomes is the main, by far and away, the main thing that, that would you know concern me about, about them. Um, Niners were loose today, going around talking to multiple players. Uh, talked to Jake Brendel for a few minutes today. Uh, just because of his story. I mean, this was a guy who didn't become an NFL starter until he's 29 years old. Then he becomes the center of the 49ers, and he goes Jimmy, Trey, Brock. Like, there's a lot going on for him, and uh, it's pretty impressive how, how he's handled it and played well. I think there's so much asked of him. Somebody asked him today, uh, you know, what, what, what's it been like playing for Kyle? And I think this is where when people ask me, you know, what, is Kyle a genius? What's Kyle's deal? I always say, well, talk to the players. Like, all the players say, especially the offensive guys, the defensive guys li love them. But the offensive guys who really, you know, deal with what his brain outputs, they don't just say, like, oh, yeah, he's a good dude. Or, yeah, oh, yeah, he's a pretty good coach. They act like their minds were blown once they started working with him. And Jake Brendel acted like his reaction today when somebody said, what was, what, you know, what was it like when you finally started working with Shanahan? He basically said, he opened my brain to a type of football that I didn't know existed. That, I'm paraphrasing, but it was that, uh, like it was that significant of a thing to him, right? That he he was a he played high school football in Texas. They were like, you know, he was an air raid kind of spread it out, uh, spread offense guy. Then he goes to UCLA. Then he bounces around a little bit in the NFL. Then he signs with the Niners five days after they lost to the Kansas City Chiefs in the 2019 Super Bowl. And um, and then he, he was a COVID year opt-out. He opted out of the 2020 season. So he shows up in 21, having not played much football the two previous years, 18 and 19 were, were not good years for him. Physically, he gets in incredible shape. And just, you know, I remember when he signed with the team thinking, all right, well, I guess this guy can compete for center. And then he became a three-year starter, which is significant because – the center for this team has had to handle so much and not just so much, but like for a young quarterback handle so much. So he's been, you know, I think in a lot of ways, probably a really, really valuable unsung guy, given how much Kyle Shanahan puts on, puts on your plate. All right, Brock Purdy. I've watched Brock Purdy talk a lot this year. So have you probably uh, in person, I've watched Brock Purdy talk a lot. I really think that you can, see things when you watch somebody talk in person that don't necessarily come across on the screen. I've always felt that way. And I thought Brock Purdy was as good at the podium as I've ever seen him today. Now, I don't want to be overly dramatic. I mean, we're talking about sitting, talking through a microphone. But I, I've always just felt like he's good, he's comfortable, maybe a little guarded. I thought he was as comfortable as I've ever seen him, not guarded at all. I, he was asked a couple questions to start uh, about his religion. So maybe that loosened him up, but I, I, I don't I don't know. I he just he was as in control with a mob around him, and it was a mob several people deep as I've ever seen him. And um I don't know that I, I didn't expect anything different. 
I think he's pretty much the same, the same guy every single time. But I thought he was excellent. If you get a chance to go watch his press conference, if you're interested in it, I recommend it. I, you know, I, I one thing that I think is really interesting about Brock. I'm going to pull something up here. Um, the the religious aspect, something we've talked about a little bit. That you know, I, I'm I'm not religious. I'm not Christian, and we don't really talk about religion on this show. There's really not much of a reason for us to do it. Uh, it's not really a part of what we do, but. Um, we talked about it a little bit after the Steve Young interview with Brock because Steve, it was clear that Steve thought part of the reason Brock Purdy plays the way he plays and handles the situations that he handles, the way he handles them, are because of his religion and his faith um, is probably the better way to put it. I think Brock clearly believes that. And I'll tell you what, I believe it. I mean, I, I think it's a... It's clearly a critical part, not just of who he is, but why he handles pressure situations and failure the way he does. And, you know, if you've been listening to the show for a while or not a while, but like a year, you know that when Brock got hurt last year, I thought what he said was really significant. And I said it at the time when the Niners had their exit interviews the day after or a couple days after they lost the NFC championship game. And it was clear Brock, you know, was headed probably towards surgery. He was at his locker and uh, he said, you know, this is a good opportunity for me to see if I'm really about everything I say that I'm about. Like, can I really live, walk the path that um, I say I walk? Because here's some adversity now. How am I going to handle it? And I thought it was really telling. It sounded good, but Brock, is it's pretty clear in his two years, he's not a guy that says, um, he's not mimicking other guys who do quarterback speak. I don't think he does that. Some young quarterbacks do. It's easy to do. You can watch any quarterback do some interviews and go, okay, that's what I'm supposed to say to the media. You know, that's not what Brock is doing. Um, and I think that's really impressive because he's not too polished, right? But I thought today he was he was very dialed. And uh, I just wanted to read something because he got asked a few questions about religion. And he explained, and I think this is really interesting because this is when you're watching the game and things you're watching Brock or maybe – they go three and out, or maybe he throws a pick, or maybe he throws a touchdown, or whatever. They show him on the sidelines what's happening. A reporter asked him, you know, said to him, I, I just spoke to your dad. He told me he's praying nonstop during a game. Are you praying nonstop during a game? And Brock said, yes, I am. But I'm not saying, oh, God, can you can you help us win? He said, uh, "It just just praying helps me stay steadfast in chaos. So when you're watching Brock and there's a lot of chaos, he is using his faith to help himself be centered. And I, I just think it's really cool that he has such a clear... Here, here's why it, it, it's really cool. He has such a clear game plan for how to handle adversity. I mentioned the other day Christian McCaffrey's off-season workouts that he described. I saw him on a podcast with uh, Brennan Scarlett, who has a podcast. He played at Stanford, and Christian was on with him this year. And he was describing the way he works out with surfers, and how they get on the wind bike for 20 minutes in the sauna, and then only then, after their heart rate is sky high, they get into a pool, they hold their breath, and they practice preparing for what it's going to be like if they get under a mega wave and the thing pulls them under. And if you struggle, you're dead, and you're supposed to just not struggle at all, but it's such a, uh, it goes against everything your body and your brain and thousands and thousands and thousands of years of, uh, of breeding have, uh, have, you know, hammered into you fight or flight fight and flight and um and so like christian has this thing that his brain he has trained to do when he's in chaos well clearly purdy does too and um you know it's really important for the quarterback it's important for the running back but the quarterback is making so many decisions that pressure or doubt or any of that stuff can really create a problem so brock actually he said he said he explained his process and i think anybody no matter your process if you have a process that helps you operate at a high level, I find that really interesting. I'm constantly fascinated by how people, I felt like I was really bad at it for a long time, figuring out how my brain works. And I've said this before on the show, figuring out, okay, the version of guy that has a lot of time to prepare for something, how do I help the version? That, that version has to help the version of me that's in the middle of you know, calling a game or whatever. In a moment, right, just like you practice a presentation, it's the same thing. But you got to help yourself be ready for that moment because when you're in the moment, 
bullets are flying. And, um, you know, the quite have you prepared yourself? So, uh, Brock said he starts his day. They asked him, you know, do you have a, have you had a, um, anything that keeps you grounded this year? And he said, yeah, Psalm 23, which again, I'm not a, we don't do, I don't do, but I just thought the verb, I'd never read it before. Cause that's not, um, you know, that's not a really big part of my life, but I really respect it. And, uh, he, and then he repeated, and then he, um, relayed some of it. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in green pastures. He leads me to calm waters. He gives me new strength. I thought the second line there, I have everything I need. was really cool because to me, like if you wanted to, to take Brock's faith and use it in some argument, uh, it's just what Joe Montana said the other day, right? I'm the mailman. I had everything I need. My job is just to deliver. I don't know if, if I don't know that Brock has intentionally done it that way, but it's true, right? I do have everything I need. It's part of the Cam Newton conversation. He does have everything he needs around him. And I think it became pretty clear pretty early that they had everything they needed him, right? What they need from their quarterback is a guy that can get the ball on schedule to these star players they got. What's the point of paying Christian McCaffrey and Debo and one day Ayuk and, you know, Kyle Juszczyk is highly paid for his position and George Kittle highly paid for his position. What's the point of all these guys if you don't get them the ball efficiently? But then on top of that, uh, I have everything I need also means, in you know, what it really means to him. I, it's internal, right? I have the mental capacity and he does have the baseline level and better than baseline level athleticism to play quarterback in this league we've seen it so i just thought that was a really cool insight um i thought it translated like the religious part of it for him those lines which are deeper than just football i think also they kind of paint a picture of the 49ers offense he does have everything he needs um yeah i don't know it was, i just thought it was a really cool insight into who he is and i think it's he's always said it you know if you've watched him talk for a couple of years it's clear that his faith is a big deal but um, I don't think I quite understood how, how, how much it really does help him play football. And uh, I've noticed that. I've, I've understood it more, I think, since he had that Steve Young conversation, and I thought he did a, he did a good job of, of explaining it today. Um, I did talk to, to our boy Kyle Juszczyk. I do want to play that here for you because you may have seen, for those of you listening to this podcast you, you either go to the YouTube or go to my Instagram page. I posted it on Instagram at Guy Haberman. There was the video the other day that went viral. George Kittle on IG put out the video of uh, um, Kyle Juszczyk and Christian McCaffrey shirtless, their pants rolled up to expose their paler thighs. I'm not one to talk, pale top to bottom. And uh, here's what... Uh, Here's what Kyle Juszczyk said about that. Could you please uh, describe what's happening here? <laughs> Could you break I had a feeling yeah, this was going to come. And why is this just on your fo your camera roll and not on Instagram? Because uh, so I could grab it quickly. <laughs> what's going on? Christian and I do this like pretty often. We just like we like to get sun. We're big uh, Andrew Huberman podcast guys. So uh, we are getting our sun. We are grounding by being, uh, you know, not having any shoes on, touching the earth, and then. And it just evolved into uh, they were they were putting new grass on our field, and there was a uh, a tool laying down there. Christian picked it up, that became his golf club. And then you know, as he was taking some swings, of course, I had to get take some swings. And um, I just learned you're never safe when George Kittle's around because that guy he will video anything and post it immediately. So, what's your sun recommendation? How much sun a day? How much do you need? How, how I'm told, and I I could be wrong here. You're supposed to get at least 10 to 20 minutes before 10 a.m. That kind of gets the circadian rhythm going, um, but I try to maximize as much sun as possible. Sounds like a good podcast. All right. Thanks, Juice. Uh, Huberman. I thought he said he heard it on the Haberman podcast, but it was the Huberman podcast. Big show. Uh, all right. So that's that. I think uh, that was what I want. That, that is what I want to hit you guys with today. Oh, a lot of a lot of discussion today. The people who were in front of Shanahan. On Monday night, we're like, oh, we didn't notice him slurring his hesses. Everyone else was like, oh, yeah, we noticed it. <laughs> so Kyle, Kyle had a good time. But he was uh, he looked well-rested and ready to roll on Tuesday. So, all right, we'll see what's in store uh, rest, of the, uh, rest of the week. But uh, appreciate you being here. If you're watching the video, hit that like. Subscribe to the channel. Thank you for that. If you're listening to the podcast, that's great. Share it with somebody. Hit a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you for that. 
I'm in Vegas. We'll see what happens next. And uh, talk to you all soon. Later.